This video focuses on single inheritance in object-oriented programming. A later video will focus on multiple inheritance and other more complicated topics. All object-oriented languages have support for single inheritance. This simple idea allows for a new class to inherit all of the methods of some parent class without needing to duplicate any code. The new child class can then be specialized by both adding new methods and overriding old methods. For example, we could have a person class with a method that provides the person's name. We can then specialize the concept of a person into several types of people, such as student and instructor, each of which has some additional specialized methods. Specifically, we will provide a way to look up the graduation year of a current student, as well as list the courses they are enrolled in, and for the sake of adding to that list, we have a method for adding an enrolled course. For the instructor, we'll simply have a way of listing the courses they're teaching and a way of adding to that list. Let's implement this specific example in Java. For this example, I've put all of the code into a single Java class file. So the class is named single, but it contains several classes within it. And this is allowed if those classes are static, as indicated by the static modifier here. Now this here is just a static method. This list names method will be useful to us because both the student and instructor classes have methods that involve listing names of courses, and so we'll reuse this bit of code. But the first class we implement is person, which is fairly simple. As I said, it is static because it is not the name of this file. It has two private data members that are both strings, the first name and the last name. The constructor requires the user to specify those strings, and there is a public method name that returns a string that simply combines the first and the last name of the person. Now because we are using Java, there is actually another hidden class here. All Java classes are also instances of a class called object. This class contains several common methods possessed by all classes such as the toString method and the hash code method. But we will not be using those methods in this example, so we can simply focus on our three classes of interest, person, student, and instructor. So we have the public static class student, once again static because it is in the same class file as the other classes, and we say that it extends person. And so this is one of Java's main keywords for inheritance. This indicates that every instance of the student class is also a person. Therefore, it also contains private first name and last name instance variables and has a name method. We add some additional member variables for the student, namely the class year and a list of the classes the student is enrolled in. The constructor for student takes in the first and last name of the person as well as their graduation year. And in order to activate the portion of the student class that is actually a person, we call super. So this call super first last is directly calling the constructor of the super class or the parent class. In other words, super first last corresponds to person first last, because person is the superclass of student. Now that these private instance variables are defined for the student, the constructor can continue to define additional values. We set the class year to be the year that was sent in as a parameter to the constructor here. And we start with an initially empty list of classes in which the student is enrolled in. Other things we add are a method for accessing the graduation year, a method for adding to that list of classes that the student is enrolled in, and finally a method for listing all those classes 
And notice that we have a println statement here that first indicates the name and then indicates that the student is enrolled in several courses. And then we call that static method earlier to list all the names, each on one line by itself. Now, why am I calling super.name? Well, to find out why, we're going to scroll down. This is a new definition for the name method. In fact, this could be indicated explicitly by using the annotation for override. So by putting this here, we are telling the Java compiler that we are aware of the fact that this method overrides a method with the same type signature in a parent class. The content of the method, the body, calls super.name. So this is the name method in the person class defined here. So we are returning the string of the first name and the last name concatenated. But we add something new. We add a comma followed by the class here. So if I simply ask an instance of the student class what the student's name is, I'll get the name followed by the class here. However, in this list enrolled courses method, I do not list the graduation year because I'm calling super.name instead of name. If I were to remove this super dot from this definition, then I would get the student's graduation year every time I call list enrolled courses. The next class is the instructor class, which is also static and also extends person. The private instances unique to the instructor class are a string indicating the instructor's job title and a list of the classes the instructor is teaching. The constructor for instructor takes first and last name and the title. We call the super constructor in the person class to define the first and the last name. We set the job title directly in this class and we initialize the list of courses being taught as empty. So this classes teaching list is very similar to the classes enrolled list of the student, except they represent two completely different things and therefore are tracked separately, even though much of the code dealing with these two entities is similar. For example, there is a method for adding to the list of courses that are taught, which is identical to the method for adding to the courses a student is enrolled in, except that the name of the variable being added to is different. It is a different list of classes being added to. We also have a method that lists the courses being taught, and in this case, we simply call the name method of the instructor class as opposed to the name method of the person class. Why do we do that? Well, in this case, we actually want to include the modifications to the name method that we're doing right here. So this is another overridden method, and it is overridden because we want to include the job title before the person's name which is retrieved using super.name, the version of the name defined in the person class. So given all of this code, we have a short test, and I'll walk you through this test and then I'll run it to show you what it does. But basically we first define a version of me using only the person class. So all that we have is my name that can be retrieved. Then we define a version of me from when I was a student. And so this requires us to define a graduation year. So that's when I graduated from Southwestern University. Here are some of the classes I took as an undergraduate. And we print that out here. Namely, we give my name using the instance of the student class. And we also can get the graduation year separately. And we can also list those courses. Finally, we have a version of me as an instructor. And this version adds the title doctor. And also indicates some courses that I've taught at SU. 
and we retrieve my name using the instructor instance and also list those courses. So let's run this code and see what the output looks like. So here's all the output. At first, we only have the version from the person class, which simply provides my name. Then the version defined using the student class, which has the graduation year. And importantly, this was printed out simply by calling s.name. So the name automatically includes the graduation year for instances of the student class. And then we can list these courses that I was enrolled in. And similarly, this output here, Dr. Jacob Schrum, was outputted by i.name, the version of the name method defined in the instructor class. And then we have the list of courses taught at SU here. Code that produces the exact same output can also be defined in C++. The code is fairly similar except for some syntactical differences here and there. Obviously the I.O. will be different. We use I.O. string and we must explicitly include this string class. We have once again a list name function that will print the contents of this time a vector rather than an array list and it will use an iterator for simplicity. But the main differences we will focus on have to do with the implementation of object-oriented features in the language. So we have a class person, and rather than indicating that each individual member variable is either private or public, we simply place the private instance variables in the private region of the class definition, and the public portions in the public region, specified by these labels with a colon. The constructor is similar to the Java version. We have a first and a last name, which are both strings. We assign those to the instance variables. And the name method will return a string, resulting from concatenating the first and the last name with a space in between them. It is when we start doing inheritance that we notice more syntactical differences. The class student inherits from the class person, and we also indicate that the inheritance is public, and what this specifically means is that if a method or member is public in the person class, it will remain public in the student class. C++ actually gives us the option of taking public members from a parent class and then hiding them in subsequent children. So I could change this to private, which would actually disable me from accessing the name method, but I don't want to do that. I want to override that. The member variables I add are for class year and the list of the classes the student is enrolled in. Those are private. The public members are a constructor, and here, rather than call super, what the constructor does is have a colon followed by the actual name of the parent class along with parameters being sent to its constructor. So we are explicitly saying that every student that is constructed will construct an instance of person using the first and last names. All that remains for the actual body of this constructor is to define the class year based on the, the year parameter sent here. We have a graduation year, which is public, an add enrolled course, which is public, and a list enrolled courses, which calls the global function defined earlier. Once again, we have a call to the name method, and we're going to override the name method within the student class to add the class year. And that's done with this sprintf function where we get the name of the student, so that's the first and the last name, as defined in the person class. So notice that I can't simply say super.name. I can't simply refer to any generic parent class. I have to indicate specifically which parent class I am calling the name method for. And then I append to that the graduation year. In the list enrolled courses method, when I show the name, I do not want to show the graduation year, so I simply call person colon colon name. The colon colon is the scope resolution operator that allows me to 
designate which class I am retrieving that copy of the method from. If we continue on, we have the instructor class, which also does a public inheritance of the person class. The new private member variables are the job title and the list of classes being taught. The constructor explicitly calls the person constructor as well, but then sets the job title within this class. And then the add taught course and list taught courses methods are similar. We override the name class in a similar fashion, simply appending the job title to the front before calling person colon colon name. And then in list taught courses, note that we call the version of the name method defined in this class. So that's why this will actually list the title uh, before saying taught. And as before, we have a means of testing this out. We define a new instance of person and then retrieve the name. We define a new instance of student. This designates the graduation year. We enroll that student in several courses, print out the student's name, the student's graduation year, and also list those courses. And then we have the instructor version, which has a title added to it. We add several taught courses to that instructor, list the instructor's name, and then list those courses. And if we run this code, we will get the exact same output that the Java version produced seen here. And sure enough, we have me as a person, me as a student, and then me as an instructor. But what about inheritance in languages that are not based on the C and C++ family of languages? This example is in the scripting language Ruby. Ruby is a purely object-oriented language. First, we define this method list names, which will be used to list the names of courses that either students are enrolled in or that instructors teach. This command, list each, performs an operation on each member of the list, which is singled out with the variable x, and puts is for put string, and so we place each member of the list to the console with a tab preceding it. But now to the class definitions and inheritance. Our base class is the person class. Now the first thing we see is this initialize method, but this is actually a constructor. Ruby classes are allowed to have exactly one constructor that is defined with the keyword initialize. Ruby also does not require the programmer to define member variables in advance. Rather, by putting an at symbol in front of this variable name, it is clear that this is a member variable that belongs to a particular instantiation of the per person class. It is being assigned the value of this local variable first. So this code defines the first name and the last name of the person when, it is, when the person class is constructed. We also have the name method and you can see by the use of the at symbols that we are retrieving the values of the instance variables for first and last name, but there is no explicit return statement. We simply have this expression as the final result of the method, and therefore it is returned by default. Next we have our student class, which inherits from the person class. And this is simply indicated with a less than symbol to show that students are persons. Now we have an initialized method that takes a first name, a last name, and a graduation year. And in this case, we do explicitly call super. Calling super will call the initialized method of the super class, which in this case is person, with the first and the last name. We also have some newly defined instance variables one for class year, and one for the list of classes the student is enrolled in, which is initialized using this array.new call. We now have a method to access the graduation year, which once again does not require an explicit return. And to add a new course, 
the list of courses a student is enrolled in, we simply use this double less than operator that appends the name to the end of this array of strings. In the next part, we both define a way of listing the enrolled courses and we override the name method. First, you can see that the name method calls the super version of itself. And so we do not have to use the word name here. Simply having the word super in this context means to call the definition of the name method in the super class. So this portion of the code that I'm highlighting puts in the first name and the last name of the student. It is appended to a comma and then to the class here, which is converted to a string for the sake of the append operation. Now above, we have the listing of courses the student is enrolled in. But first, we print to the console the name of the student. But in this case, calling the super classes version of the name method is trickier. In this context below, simply calling super within the overriding definition of the name method meant that we would call the name method in the super class. But in this context, I want to call the super classes name method from inside of the list enrolled courses method. This is why I must explicitly indicate that I'm looking for a method called name and that I want the super version of that method and that I want to call it. So that aspect is quite a bit trickier. This gets us the name of the student without the student's graduation year. Next, I simply call the list names method with the list of classes that the student is enrolled in. Moving on to the instructor class, we see many similar operations. The instructor class inherits from the person class, as indicated by this line at the top. We initialize the instructor by calling super first last, that is the constructor in the person class. We define the job title and a new empty list of the classes the instructor is teaching. We add to that list in a similar way. And we can list the courses being taught in a similar way. Note that here we are content to use the version of name that is defined below. We do not need to call the superclasses version of that method. And we once again override name but in a different way. We simply put the job title in front of the instructor's name, which once again is retrieved using the super word in isolation. And then the code below will test this. Here we define a new person with the parameters get from, so that when we access the name, we will see the name of that person. Here we have a definition of me as a student, which adds the graduation year. We then add several courses and then access the name, the graduation year, and print the list of enrolled courses. And then we do a version of this using the instructor class, which has the title at the end. We add courses in a similar way and then access the name and print the list in a similar way as well. And this code when run gives us, once again, the exact same output that we've been seeing for the previous examples. Despite some syntactical differences, the differences between these three code examples are actually quite small, at least in terms of structure. All of these examples involve a base class person and then two inheriting classes, student and instructor and each of those classes has more or less the same method. However, when we want one class to inherit attributes from two different parent classes, we will see that drastically different code solutions are needed in each of these languages. 